Good evening, everyone, uh, genre committee members and other people who love genre. Tonight is a very special night. We, uh, my name is Dwayne Johnson Cochran, the chair of the genre committee, Writers Guild of America West. And uh, we have a very special uh, panel. It's our final uh, event for the year 2022. Um, we uh, decide to do something big for our, our members. And this is a big one. This is Star Trek. So we're going to go deep into it. Many generations, many shows. We have a lot of people on this panel who will be representing many different iterations of the show. Um, before we go, Kelly Jo Brick, co-chair, she has some updates. Yeah, I just want to send out some thank yous tonight, first of all, to our panelists. Uh, thank you so much for your time joining us in this busy month uh, of December and sharing all your experiences. Um, also, a big thank you to Greg Mitchell, our guild liaison, for all he does behind the scenes to make um, our events shine and to make uh, to help writers across the board. Greatly appreciated. And then also to Phil, our moderator for tonight, for bringing this event to the group um, and uh, leading the way tonight. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Phil. Phil, oh, there you go. Thank you, Kelly Joe, and thank everyone again for joining us for this. Uh, Greg, you are really great at making us all look good with what you do to set this up, so I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Phil Perello. I'm a WGA TV and features writer, and uh, I have seen more episodes of Star Trek than I've had hot meals. Uh, my wife, it's embarrassing. <laughs> it's embarrassing that I, I that my wife puts up with it so much. Uh, so talking about this load-bearing column of television with the people who have helped shape it is an all-timer for me. So again, I appreciate it. And uh, given that Star Trek has spent the better part of the last 60 years promoting diversity and exclusively, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, diversity and inclusivity, I really appreciate the panelists uh, helping us continue that tradition for the next 90 minutes. And uh, we're also making some uh, Trek history tonight, or at least some Guild history, uh, not counting the Mirror Universe where we're all rocking Spock goatees and get paid on time. Um, this is the first time there's ever been like an Avengers Endgame assembly <laughs> across the various series. And, you know, I wish Zoom had a filter. We could all like Doctor Strange portal in. Uh, but I guess I'm just going to have to settle for uh, if everyone can just go around the horn, introduce themselves and their title in the Star Trek shows they've worked on or are currently working on. So we'll start with uh, Brandon. Oh, my name is Brandon Braga, and I worked on the Star Trek franchise as a writer and executive producer for 15 years, from uh, 1990 to 2004, and I worked on uh, Next Generation, Voyager, and Enterprise, and wrote two of the feature films, Generations and First Contact. Awesome. Uh, Terry? Uh, hi, my name is Terry Metalis. Um, I started on Star Trek as a PA uh, on a show called Voyager, uh, where then I eventually became a writer's assistant to this monstrous executive producer, uh, <laughs> <by> Brandon Braga, <laughs> who uh, and then I went on to uh, to Enterprise, where I sold stories, and then uh, since then I, I I did a show called Twelve Monkeys, created a show and became a showrunner there, and. Uh, I came back to Star Trek recently as a showrunner on Picard. Uh, uh, Kayla. Hi, Kayla Cooper. I was a co-EP on Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Yay. <laughs> Great show. Chris? Uh, this is Chris Derrick, and I was the story editor on Star Trek Picard. Uh, Noreen? Noreen Shankar. I uh, started my career on Next Generation um, there for the last three years and uh, did um, episodes of Deep Space Nine and, and one of Voyager as well. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, Robert. Uh, Robert Hugh Wolf. I uh, started with a freelance on uh, Star Trek Next Generation and then I worked on um, Deep Space Nine for five years. I rose up from staff writer to producer. Um, on that show. Uh, Catherine? Uh, hi, I'm Catherine. I'm a supervising producer on Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And uh, before this, I was on Star Trek Section 31, and I was on Star Trek Lower Decks, which I'm still a consultant on. Awesome. And uh, Kirsten? Hi, I'm Kirsten Beyer. I started out actually in the novel verse for Star Trek, I wrote novels for about 15 years, and then came on Discovery as a staff writer. 
and have since worked my way up to a co-creator of Star Trek Picard, continuing as a consulting producer on Discovery, uh, and now a co-EP on Strange New Worlds. And, and to kick it off, I have a question for Brandon and Terry. Uh, Brandon, uh, on a scale from nine to 10, how cool is it, or maybe not so cool, to see like your former assistant pick up on stories that <laughs> started uh, almost 30 years ago? Don't, don't fuck it up. <laughs> By the way, I, he texts me that every single morning. So um, I, I, I mean, I'm blown away. I'm, I'm not surprised at all because he always was hugely talented. And um, I just think it's the coolest thing ever, you know, particularly, particularly in that he's picking up characters, the characters I started off with, you know, it's just, it's cool. And Terry, for you, like what, from your, you know, experience yeah. with that, um, what were some of the ideas that you took with you for your experience now in Picard? Well, you know, when I, I started working for Brandon, I, I I was a fan. I wouldn't tell him that, but I was. I, I had already. I had seen First Contact six times in the movie theater, and maybe wore a uniform <laughs> to one of those screenings. Um, but um, so it's the whole thing has been just a, a wild uh, adventure and, and and an honor to kind of in this season we jump back into some of the story arcs that were set up by Brandon and and Ron and Noreen and, and and everyone so uh it's it's surreal that is the only way to describe it sure and I I guess like a question for you know for everyone um you know we have writers on this panel that have worked in the traditional model of Trek TV for years you know the 26 episodes a season run and now it's you know moved into streaming like can you compare those experiences, like what are the challenges from working on like a show like TNG to Enterprise versus, you know, the the more streaming shows that have come out of the recent Trek run? I'll, I'll tell you something, how we did 26 episodes a season, I, I just don't know. Yeah. Because doing eight episodes of, in a season <laughs> seems impossible at the moment. You know, it, it's somehow the work, and it's all done in the same amount of time. Yeah. yeah. The staffs were very small too. That's the other thing that- they were kind of looking back blows my mind is like there were five of us on on deep space nine there were what five or six of you on next generation most of the time right yeah. and we were and we were still doing 26 a year that's why like like we all have like 30 credits on each show that we were on <laughs> you know because we were just writing non-stop i mean it was just like the the treadmill never the never it never stopped it was hilarious getting to the end of the season because you'd be on the lot longer than any other show. I mean, oh, I yeah. remember those days, the entire Paramount lot would be deserted and we'd be finishing episode 26 and then you'd go home for like a weekend and then you come back and start the next season. Yeah, we it we was got like two really weeks off. Come on, man. Yeah, it was <laughs> yeah. Very short. I remember it was that. Really, really short hiatus. Yeah, yeah. it was. You're muted, Phil, I think, or lost your audio. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. Uh, since so since each room has their different process, and you know, we got various writers from various writers' rooms, like what what was you know breaking story like on DS9 and TNG? Like, did you throw up note cards? Did you put it on the dry erase board? Like, what was the process there? Yeah, it was it was we, well on next gen and uh Voyager, we used uh, just a dry erase board usually. Yeah. And just put the put it up scene by scene. I mean, it was important to get a mm -hmm. solid when you're doing a lot of episodes, and you're just and they were seven day shooting schedules back then. I think we got like four eight day episodes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the story eating machine was was always hungry, and you had to really be surgical about what you were planning um, because. They had to build these sets fast. They had to create these alien costumes fast. Mm -hmm. Had to have you know the outline pretty tidy. We 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 did the same thing on Deep Space Nine. We had a dry erase board. The intern usually wrote on the board, and we would we would usually break story in the afternoon. Like we would break an episode in usually like three or four days tops. Like we didn't take a lot of time, and because uh, we didn't have a lot of time. Yep. And, you know, for those of you who are working on shows when the feature films were concurrently in development, how did, 
you know, that process affect what was being done on TV? Or were, were you guys in constant communication with, with Berman and, and the other execs on that? I remember Ron and Brandon abandoning us and saying, bye, we're going <laughs> to do a movie. Uh, well, you guys finish the rest of the season. <laughs> <laughs> it was all, you know, there was, a, it was, it was all kind of one family. So there were a lot of people who worked on the shows that did the movie, the movies as well. Um, so we we tried to do it all. Um, I think Ron and I, Ron Moore and I were writing the first uh, Star Trek movie we did at the same time we were writing the finale of yeah. Next Generation, which turned out way better than the movie. Um, so it's, a lot of that stuff was done con concurrently. Um, they just ignored us on Deep Space Nine. We were we were the middle child. <laughs> <laughs> did whatever we wanted. Nobody talked to us. It's great. <laughs> we're, on, we're on the floor above us. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we were all in the same building. We saw each other all the time. Actually, we we talked all the time. It was it was definitely a, uh, I mean, it was a it was a fraternity because those were the days where, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, it was except for poor Lisa, Lisa Clink and and Jerry and Jerry. Yeah. yeah, you tried to get Jerry for this. She was very hard to get a hold of. I wish we could have got her. She's living up in Carmel now. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Kayla, with with uh, Strange New Worlds, and and and, and Catherine, you know, please chime in too. Um, with Strange New Worlds emerging as like the like temple Trek show that everyone seems to be getting behind, like what was it like for you to see that reaction now, and compared to what it was like being in the trenches when you were working on it? For me, it was fulfilling because, like, as Kirsten can also say, it's like. I wouldn't say we were necessarily in the trenches like we had a lot of fun in that room uh, a lot of the time like obviously like with any show there will be ups and downs and we had our days but just like enjoying the stuff that we were creating and wondering is like is this going to translate because we're having fun right. is everyone else and then to see the reactions of everyone else <laughs> Oh, hell yeah, because I, like, speaking of episode 108, which is a fantasy episode, which, like, I love those episodes of Star Trek when they become <laughs> other characters, and so that was a dream come true for me to get to write that kind of a Star Trek episode, and it was like, what are we going to do for the costumes? Are we going to have the budget for this? And blah, 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 and, like, just to see that, like, the cast and costuming and production and like set design and everyone just came together to make that happen and then to see the fan response was just like yes it was a relief and it was a joy that's awesome yeah Turned i just remember great. sort of i remember sort of feeling relieved when we started working on strange new worlds because we were moving to this episodic model as opposed to the mm -hmm. serialized work we were doing in discovery and picard and it was such a breath of fresh air to sort of not like bring the story down into this sort of manageable bite-sized thing as opposed to everything you're doing impacting five or six different episodes and mm -hmm. having to backwards um so that was fun it's awesome i guess like to piggyback off that a bit like how important then is canon to a track like how much do you worry about oh, that fucking fan's going to nitpick because we didn't use the right color on this? And how much do you just go, you know what, we just got to service the story? I think it's, uh, it's a kind of a constant high wire act. Um, canon is super important. You don't want the stories you're telling to um, take people out of their experience of the universe as they're watching it, you know? Um, but at the same time, um, you do need to serve story. That has to come first. Um, so, uh, it's something that I don't, I think people maybe think we're not as aware of it as we are, or talk about it as much as we do, but I mean, you know, Terry, we'd go a thousand hours over the tiniest things sometimes tiniest things. just yeah. to make sure we were, we were getting it as close to right as we could without, or you know. The harder thing is you, you go down the road on something you're pretty darn sure fits into canon. And then somebody's on memory alpha and goes, ah, uh, and you're like, oh, come on. And you throw a bag <laughs> of chips across the, the room. Um, but it it is it is quite difficult. I mean, it is a considerable amount of time. Uh, I mean, an yeah, episode yeah. of story. There's a thousand, there's, I don't know what the number is now, but you've got well over a thousand episodes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of stuff that, where stuff happened. <laughs> Uh, and um, it's a lot. We kind of dwarf the Marvel universe. Yeah. 
we would talk about on Next Generation, just the incredible weight of, you know, the 79 episodes of the original series, plus a few seasons of Next Gen and, you know, whatever at that time, five movies, you know, and that seemed like an incredible amount of material. What stories could we possibly tell? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just, it's, it, it's got to be so much harder now because <laughs> exactly. like we, we were struggling with it all the time. Yeah. And we had someone on staff who, would, because there was no internet database of this stuff, so we had someone on staff who would look right. stuff up and and sure. double, make sure we weren't screwing things up. And we mostly paid attention to them, although yeah, there obviously, was the like, there, was, there, was there are some user, built-in inconsistencies yeah. in canon, so you just. I kind there of was like a, embrace there, that. It <laughs> was a Usenet forum that would, you know, go out of their way to abuse us every single week we aired an episode, <laughs> as, as I recall. We would get like stacks of printed out, like, you know, Usenet forum, you know, reviews, which were up, just abusive, <laughs> like beginning to end every week. You know what's cool, though? It's like it, it the, the most challenging thing I found was you can't really repeat storylines. Uh, they'll, I mean, they remember, the fans know all the episodes, and so, but it also kind of uh, spurs you on to constantly kind of create new things, if you can, uh, if you're having a good week. And I, I like that, you know, the newer versions of Trek, they seem to be embracing, you know, you can do a horror episode a week, at least that's what Strange New Worlds did this past season, and I know TNG wanted to do more stuff like that at a time, like, what is it? Like, like, what are the the restrictions for New Trek now for those who are working on it? Like, is there any mandates from the network? Like, hey, don't go here or just do what you want. I I don't remember any specific mandates. It was there were conversations, obviously. Like, the Gorn are a thing, and so it's like, how are we going to depict the Gorn when technically in canon they don't meet them until you know Kirk gets trapped on that planet and then we're like well it's baby Gorn and then you know we take that ball and run with it um but yeah I don't Kirsten can I yeah I don't think we had any no 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 don't don't touch that it was like let's talk about it and like the discussion of how we were going to do it but but mostly we were supported great awesome. yeah no I don't think anything's really off limits yeah and and Chris I, I know from talking to you before like you're a big fan of Trek, just like me, maybe even bigger. What was that experience like for you and, and also you know, for Terry to bring that fandom to the writer's room? Well, I mean, I, I think it was, you know, I, to me, like it was very exciting to, you know, to, to write for these characters that were so legacy. I think that was one of the biggest differences. You talk about the, you talk about the, the canon, it's like, you know, that, you know, Picard, there was there was so much that was in place that we that, you know that was always being talked about and being considered in in episodes of you know that people had that we had to reference a lot. I mean, I think there was something interesting that Terry had said at the top of us, you know, um, trying to figure out the season for season three. He had said something about how in Star Wars, the final trilogy, there was never a moment that we saw, you know, like Han and Luke and Leia together in the same scene. And Terry was like, we can't have that for this. Are oh, you talking, you're talking about the JJ, the, the, the new Star Wars movies. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and so for us, I mean, so, you know, so what we thought about for bringing back the cast for the front to the third season was such a, it was such a, I mean, for me, it was something exciting. It was something exciting for everybody. It was like, okay, this is, you know, these are the characters that got me into this, that, you know, you know, like Star Trek and thinking about it and seeing it happen, you know, like, like seeing it happening in real time as opposed to the stuff with Kirk from the 60s. And so for me, just to say, wow, this is like so exciting to write and to think about these characters and the, the place that we put them, you know, which you guys will see in a couple months, but, you know, but coming up with like, okay, so where are they now? Like, like where are they now became, you, you know, something that was, I think for us when we were trying to figure that out, like just, I, I, there was so much fun and excitement just trying to figure that out. You know, when you're trying to figure out, this is Worf, this is Jordy now, you know, as a, and trying to figure out like that trajectory in a way that was not gonna be expected, but, but still fit within like, like who they were. Can I ask a question? Please do, yeah. So, in the final episode of All Good Things, 
of all good things, final episode of Next Gen. Are they kind of the age? Yes. Now? Yeah. So and, how, and do you, how do you, how do you, how was that handled? Or you, uh, you, well, you we know? did we actually nod to all good things in that uh, Jordi has two daughters, Alondra and Sydney, which is in that alternate future. He says, he, I think he has three daughters, I think. Uh, but Alondra and Sydney were two of them. So we, we, we sort of said that alternate future had some things that were accurate, uh, but in this case, not all of them. But no, we watched all good things many times. <laughs> Great. Now, in terms of, uh, I mean, if I was on one of the old shows and I'm watching one of these new shows and I'm seeing this VFX budget, like, I don't know, how you watch, I don't know how you watch that and go, what the fuck was this for that, that, I, that, I'm, I watch these episodes these guys are doing and I'm like, so jealous of your, your spectacular, <laughs> your visual, like Strange New World just has these spectacular <clears throat> visual effects. Right. Um, and uh, you've really taken it to the next level. For, for me, it's hilarious <laughs> because I went from Star Trek to doing Androm Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda, we had a third of the money that Star Trek had. And so I, I, I sort of went from, so in, in my mind, like Deep Space Nine had all the money we could ever use, but but now I'm watching this stuff and I'm jealous as hell, I gotta be honest. There's just a, yeah. like so many things we wanted to do that we just never had the budget to do, just like um, EV suits. You know, we just never had the budget to do them, you know, walk on the hall, go outside, you know, couldn't do it. It's, it is funny though, because the more things change, the more they stay the same, because even when you have to build a new starship, or for instance, there's a lot of new starships in season three of Picard, you can't just tell visual effects to render something like that. So sometimes you're, you're, you're like, well, we'll just, let's just take two of the nacelles off of that one and put that saucer there and we'll call it a day. Which is exactly what they did back in Next Gen, where they go to the old models. The Enterprise C is a, is a, is a kit bash kind of thing. So we were essentially the same. It just a lot more <laughs> money involved. Kind we, of the same. <laughs> we had ten thousand dollars and more for Odo, and I remember <laughs> we could only afford like one more for an episode max. You know, so so we were always running around stuff like that. Uh, I talked to Ron last year and uh, Ron Moore, and he or two years ago, and he said that when he was watching New Trek, it was triggering for him because he remembers having to count phaser blasts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Oh, that's yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's something right. we need to do. We, we, do we still that. do that. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. And they oh, yeah. Why yeah. don't they ever sit in those meetings? Why don't what? they ever get cheaper? It's like beaming someone away. Never got, yeah. like, same, yeah. guys, it's the same effect. Uh, it's <laughs> time, and you're still charging the same amount of money. It just, there's something going on there, man. It, it feels <laughs> like racket. a racket. It yeah. feels like a racket. I agree. Ferengi. <laughs> Someone who worked on a Trek show told me once that it costs more to do the transparent screen effect than to make a ship or to make a phaser blast. Is that accurate? You're talking about the view uh, screen? Yeah, the view the, screen. The it's expensive. No. View screen's expensive. There's no, there's no possible way that could be true. I wasn't that <laughs> use screen was not expensive for us. So so there's a racket. Speaking of the racket, like we just oh, threw yeah. a green screen up there. It was easy. The use screens were cheap. Yeah, you, you, you were very careful about which direction you pointed the camera. You know, you, yeah, yeah. The camera had to be very rarely yeah. saw you only saw that view screen if it was a, a, a story point. Yeah. Yeah. And it had to be oh. a clean shot. If anyone walked in front of it, that was you, you were dead. That was a disaster. We learned that lesson the hard way with Picard season three because our, we designed this new bridge and our brilliant production designer, Dave Blast, made the biggest view screen you've ever seen. And so there really is every shot turn around <laughs> without some level of compositing. You're like, well, oh, man. The big city. Of this. Weren't, the, weren't the sets in the Klingon ship in the, se in the first <clears throat> season of... Um of a discovery virtual beyond a certain point. And didn't that cause a bunch of problems? I thought I, re I remember someone telling me that, that there was like, there were there were definitely production issues with some of that Klingon ship stuff. The Klingon ship was huge. It was like gigantic. And the one of the most challenging part, parts was it didn't have a lot of individual rooms in it. It was just kind of one big space. So finding a way to make clear where you were and also get the feel that we were on a ship that had 
you know, rooms in it was really tough. Wow. And uh, Kristen, since we're talking about Discovery, I, you know, obviously Star Trek started as the Mission of the Week show. And Discovery has really embraced this serialized, you know, MacGuffin of the season like format. Um, can you talk about like the process of settling in on that? Like, is that a, was that something de decided from the beginning to distinguish Discovery from other Trek? Yeah, very much so. I, from, from day one, um, we were going to be serialized and we were going to be telling the story of, you know, a first officer um, and taking them on this journey. We wanted to sort of vary the narrative point of view a little bit. Um, and yeah, the, we were always thinking, you know, all 10 episodes, all 12, 13, whatever we were, because it's sort of changed season to season. Um, you know, where are we going with this? But the, you know, the focus was always the characters, emotional journeys and arcs as much as the, whatever the science fiction hook or the big puzzle thing was going to be. Um, we were always erring on the side of character. And that for everyone in terms of like the process of breaking story in the room, like what, what comes usually first for you? Is it this character is going to go through X or is it more like a plot or story idea? I mean, it kind of depends on the show, right? Like mm -hmm. um, uh, we always talk uh, at the beginning of Strange New Worlds every year, um, you know, generally about the characters, like over a season, this is going to happen. But once we get to, once we get, when we sort of settle on that, um, it, it goes episode by episode, like, you know, what genre we want to hit it and, and what's the best way to serve that. And then we find a way to thread the character arcs through that. That's great. Mm -hmm. I, I tried. I try and hit both at the same time if you can. It's really hard, but it, it's usually asking what's going to be the most entertaining, you know, arc to bring these characters through, and where do you want to end? Knowing your end point is to me has always been the most Im important thing, um, and. Uh, uh, so that, but then usually the, you want the high concept like happening at the same time. If you can find those two together, then you've got something. The, the perfect, you know, it, it, you're, the alchemy, as you're, as you're pointing out, the, the perfect alchemy when we were doing it was you would have a, a, a great science fiction concept that has a great character arc with some kind of thematic resonance. Mm -hmm. those, those three things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when and when they all combined, they those usually would become kind of like the classic episodes. Yeah. And, and as I as I recall, Brandon, we, and we about, also any one of those three elements could provoke a story. Right, you know. Right. I'm sorry. And oh no, uh, I was just thinking that we didn't. I don't recall much talk about really arcing the characters across a season. Right. We would. We would. We almost never really had that kind uh, of the studio. The studio we did not want it. Yeah. But forbade. Like doing a two-parter, you have to remember when the first yeah. when the first next generation two-parter, the <laughs> Borg two-parter, they had to put at the bottom of the screen at the end of part one to be continued. To continue. and, yes, so, yeah, so exactly. Not to confuse yeah. the audience, right? Because that's how rare yeah. the serial any kind of serialized storytelling well, was. And it was partially yeah, was driven, sick. and it was partially driven by the business side, right? Because right. shows would take these in syndication and then air them out of order, like however they wanted to. They would strip them, as they would 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 uh, used to refer to it. And so that was terrible. If you had, you know, one episode, you know, after in the wrong order, uh, that's going to mess everything up. So they all have to be self-contained. Super weird to think about now. Like, well, we were pushing up against that the whole time, right? Because oh we yeah, would show that really. Yeah leaned into serialization right and we kind of again like we had a little bit of benevolent neglect i think at the end of the day but there was always pushback from the from the essentially from the studio because yeah they were really looking at this as like no someone's going to come home at you know seven o'clock at night they're going to sit down and they didn't see yesterday's episode this is the first time all week they got to see an episode and we can't do we can't do serialization so it was just the way people watch TV was so different back then. It was like the old. Um, you did it on Deep Space yeah, Nine. Well, yeah. We did it, 
Yeah. But but it was very we were very careful and and it was very tentative, you know. And it was always like pushing the envelope a little bit. How much pushback do we get? Okay, dial it back a little bit. But what we generally tended to do was we would still have that strong standalone A story every every episode, almost every episode. Yeah. It stood on its own. You could just watch that. But then we would thread in the B story and the character stories would usually have some level of serialization. And we did do the whole thing where we sat down at the beginning of the season and said like, where are our characters going this year? And where is our story going this year? More or less, right? A lot of times we were flying by the seat of our pants. But but yeah, it was it was an evolution, you know? And it was, it was very tentative and fits and starts. And obviously, you know, by the end, they did a 10-parter. But even the fact that they thought about it as a 10-parter and not just like, that's just television, you know? <laughs> yeah. That was a totally different world. Crazy. So, so you so when when the TNG DS9 era, when they would, or even Enterprise, when when you guys would come back into for a new season, it was just a clean slate. There was no where do we want to pick up this thread or or whatever. I mean, other than like where the big clip <clears throat> the season's finale. It slowly but surely became more more serialized and the thing that changed everything at least when while i was there was uh 24. Yeah. um all of a sudden it was uh, okay like uh because like day daytime soap operas were the only ones doing serialization on that level uh and in the third season of enterprise we were given permission to do a seasonal a 24 episode seasonal arc um, and with mixed success because everything we, we we always wanted to do it and then realized I don't think we know how to do this <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a perfect <laughs> season but uh um I, but that's that's when discovery came out I was really intrigued that you had decided to to embrace the serialization from the get-go yeah, yeah. It, it really is a different kind of thing and it, it can be very gratifying on the character level the thing that we actually had to our advantage when it came to that stuff on deep space nine was we did do 26 episodes a year too so we could convey a serialized story in eight or 10 or 15 of those and then the other ones aside from little character bits mm -hmm. just feel like star trek you know <laughs> yeah, uh brennan like at that moment in production i don't know how far it was when you realized uh, maybe we don't know how to do this like episode three <laughs> was indie art wow so I, I like i don't know how to put this but you know with social media being what it is and fans having this over your shoulder reaction either as your stuff's rolling out or as you're creating it you know, there seems to be like a tendency for people to maybe want to change their stuff or whatever. But back then, like there was no, like oh, there was. Oh, there was. There was okay. Oh, yeah, this is form. AOL chats and stuff. Like, how much did that influence changing creative choices? I think back then I would have said not at all. But the, the truth is, we were reading these reviews obsessively. I was. I mean, I wanted to see. I mean, you air an episode, you get reviews the next morning. Sometimes as it was airing or right after it aired mm -hmm. um so we we wanted to see what the fan reaction was to stuff yeah but at least you didn't have twitter yeah <laughs> no those were the good days trust me <laughs> like with, with so many shows now you know block shot and and you know they're all mostly banked by the time they they're set to air like is there an opportunity to course correct creatively at that point, or is it just we'll get it right next season, or we'll address it next season? Well, you got to trust your storytelling instincts. I mean, if you're going to course correct based on fan response, you're you're going to go uh, insane. Right. Um, but sometimes a fan will have an insight or a comment that that resonates, you know. Um, and it it is a unique show, a unique franchise. And that it really is one, you know, I'm always struck when I go to a, like a, a Star Trek convention, you walk in the room and there are five to 10,000 mm -hmm. people who all have this shared history. It's a fictional history. Right. But you could strike up a conversation with any one of those people about Star Trek 
and the history, it, 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 it's really, a, so you can't, to me, I can't speak for the other writers here, you can't separate the fandom from it. Not completely, you just can't because they're part of it. They're part of what made it successful. And I don't know of any, uh, I mean, there, there are many f passionate fan bases out there, but these are the OG fans, man. <laughs> I mean, we kind of had to deal with like, yeah, there was no Twitter, but like, it was the early days of the internet. We got a flood of stuff, but also we got a lot of mail, man. Like, oh yeah, we got so much mail. We had people whose job it was to read the mail and let us know if there was anything we, they thought we wanted to see, you know. And it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a, a lot of shows now are adjusting to being with an engaged fan base. We we always had it, always had it from the very beginning. Was there any instance of fan mail that made you guys go, you know what, maybe we're they're onto something? You know, it it was to me when an episode was popular, it told you something. And you never knew. I mean, some episodes like yesterday's Enterprise, uh, yeah. which I wasn't around for, uh, became very popular. Um, I did a, a time loop episode called Cause and Effect that I was convinced was the worst episode of Star Trek ever written. And it was terrible. It was a, a, a goofy idea that didn't really make any sense whatsoever, but became a popular episode. So you'd look at You'd look at what they, people liked. And of course, there were these capsule reviews happening too, like in Cine Fantastic magazine. Right. And there were magazines. They would come out with like, the, they'd review your season episode by episode. And you'd look at it and you'd look at which ones got four stars. Yeah. Which ones got one star. <laughs> Cause and effect is great. For what it's worth, we reference it a lot in the Strange New Worlds room. We reference it a lot in Lower Decks. It's great. I'd say it's referenced in a lot of writers' rooms. Yeah. Any science fiction, you know, we I did a time travel show. Cause and effect came up once a week. Yeah. Mm. It's like cause and effect, frame of mind. Like there's a handful of episodes that I think are just always mm -hmm. referenced. You guys can, but you guys know what I mean. You yeah. don't yeah. You, you don't necessarily know which episodes are gonna resonate, you know, with people. For, um, for Catherine, uh, you have a very unique experience being on the animated side and in the live action. And fandom is uh, very vocal, to put it yes. on, on both of those shows. So two-part question, I guess. what? How do you negotiate that experience? How do you and the writers negotiate that experience uh, with the fans? And two, like, what are... I guess, like, is it more freeing to work on animated in terms of, like, the canon than it is on the live action side? Um, for the first part of that question, I don't use social media, so that makes it very easy to negotiate the fandom. I mean, I'm on like, you know, Facebook, but that's like a private thing. So I think not having Twitter or anything uh, really helps. And uh, for the canon, no, the canon is just as tough on the animated show. I'm actually the canon consultant on that show. And so it's... Um, it's a lot because of the way on Lower Decks that we just, it's just gag, 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 one after the other sometimes. And each of those is tied to canon. So I have to read the scripts and kind of circle, you know, virtually circle and be like, oh, actually in a Klingon ritual, it would be this instead of this. And <laughs> so, uh, I try to, you know, obviously we have to let it bend for it to work, um, but I, I try to not let it break when when I can, you know? I highly recommend not being on social media. <laughs> uh, I'm quickly realizing I'm that. <laughs> um, Terry, back uh, to you. You said, you know, season three is being billed as in the final voyage of Next Gen, and they've had two of these so far, both on the big screen and on the small screen. But this one seems very different. It seems more personal, more emotional. So how do you, I guess, chart their third finale based on where they've come before. Yeah, well, I mean, it, uh, yeah, uh, it's terrifying uh, and you wanna do it right. <laughs> I think that, you know, look, All Good Things isn't just like a great Star Trek finale. It's one of the great series finales of all time. Um, but they went on and did four more movies after that. And as a fan, I always felt that um, 
and not not speaking ill of Nemesis, but it didn't feel like the sort of send off that say Undiscovered Country was uh, to the the original crew, and there was suddenly an opportunity to do that here, um, but it was richer in some ways because you had now had 20, 25 years, you hadn't seen these characters and you could now pop in and see where they ended up. And um, what if, what if we could do that right? You know, and, and took a lot of convincing to a lot of different people and, and, uh, and the actors, you know, I wanted to make sure, you know, they have, they go to, to conventions and speak about their characters and know things about their characters that we, that we don't think about. And so we wanted to make sure um, they were happy as well. And so it was, uh, it was very uh, uh, challenging, but incredibly gratifying to, to be able to do that. And in terms of working with the actors, whether it's, you know, these legacy performers who have done you know, Picard, Dr. Crusher, all of them, and, and to like the newer shows, like what is the, the relationship with the writer and, and the actors? Like, Berman's era writers were rarely on set is what Ron told me. Like, what is that like now? Uh, it, it is, uh, you know, it, and it's funny because uh, uh, Gates and LeVar and they would often reference that. I mean, look, it's, it's as Brandon said, you're making 26 of these. You can't have a writer on set. They got to be at a typewriter somewhere <laughs> getting the next ep episode done. So um so it is it is quite different you know and it's serialized and this was a lot more intimate uh, uh stories and um uh, look i mean it, it's a different it's different for every showrunner I, I mean i always believe there at least needs to be a writer on set um to to track because you can the, the tiniest most subtle line could be read in a, in a way that's that totally inaccurate and changes the story um so, but I, I think that's probably the norm now, I would I would say. I don't know. What do you all think? Having writers on set? No. Yeah, it's it's become the norm. Yeah. Like for my entire career, basically. Like I've known like writers to cover set. I agree with that. Yeah, same for me. Though now I would say like one of the, the sad things is with streaming, not necessarily shitting on streaming, but um, it's harder for mid-level and lower level writers to go to set because they want to focus on the showrunner slash creator doing everything. And maybe you'd get a co-EP on set. Um, I think like Luke Cage was the last time like writers of their episodes went to cover set like all the other shows I've done streaming since then, it's just been the showrunner, so. A lot of times you guys like, are wrapped by the time yeah. the show shoots too, right? If you're not, yeah. the, if you're not the EPs, you're gone. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not paying. That's rough. Yeah. Yep. Um, for those writers who have gone to set and for those you know, watching who haven't yet, um, uh, for the panelists, like what are some tips you wish you knew before your first time on set that would be helpful for writers to know now? Uh, when you're listening to it on set, even if you're a staff writer and you can hear that it sucks, jump in. Yeah. Because this is it. You don't want to do ADR. Um, I, again, <laughs> I think it's it's probably the most educational experience if you're not doing a table read. Um, suddenly, that brilliant line you thought you had an actor has no idea what that was supposed to be or is doing it another way, or it's just not a good line the way you thought it was. And so you have maybe 10 minutes to sort it out with the, and your actors as your partners and hopefully your director as well are, are all in it together because they want the scene to work. I, I would recommend, I would recommend a good relationship with the director. It always yeah. makes things a lot easier. Yes. Yeah. I would say if you're like, if it's your first time, especially like talk with your showrunner, it's like, what am I empowered to do on set so that I don't have to call you and ask you? And then what do you want me to call you and ask you for? It's a bummer that, you know, with the, the short rooms these days, you don't get to sit in if you're a lower level or mid-level writer on a tone meeting, you don't get to actually mm -hmm. sit through these things and really understand how the show works. 
and it's it's a shame because a lot of education and apprenticeship is going out of the business it seems um and that's really problematic yeah, oh, yeah. i remember like narain and i worked on grim and i like constantly try to insert myself into like covering other people's episodes just <laughs> for the experience like i jose molina like i think he got sick and he couldn't cover his episode so like i'll do it i'll do it because like i knew i needed that experience that's great. That was Chris on season three of Picard. Chris, I mean, you lived, you would live down there as long as you could. I did. I did. Cause I, it was so exciting to see all the actors and to see it happen. And it was, you know, and Frakes was really, you know, a Frakes, he, he directed what two episodes of, of, of season three. And he was just, he was so um, like, I think there was so much like information he had to, to impart about the show about the episode about directing about just like the production of it and also because he's starring in it and he understands this you know like the whole dynamic i, I was it's something different i guess it's very rare i guess for the actor to be you know he's also directing episodes as well and he's starring in them while he's shooting himself which is like so i think a rare like it's, it's super rare for television but he knew it so well and he directed so you know he directed some great movies uh, like like of star trek that we we're you know, for me to be down there and just in this, to be at his feet and have him talk and ask him questions, you know, and he would come by at the, you know, like between takes sometimes and he'd just like talk about, you know, what was happening or, you know, or there's questions I would have and I would ask him or I would ask the director. I mean, the guy, he was the, the producing director for season three, like he was down there a lot too. And it was just like, I mean, it was something exciting to talk with them about the whole process, you know, and also we were lucky enough that the writer's room was th there on the same lot as the- Yeah, that's the, very rare too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah mostly here in another country sometimes, so. <laughs> Good, wow. Uh, uh, Chris, I just, you know, curious, like since you were on set and, you know, for writers watching who were at your level, uh, what, did you learn from the production process that helped changed or influence your writing process? Well, I mean, to me, I, I think there was a, I think there was a time in season two when I was asking Terry a question about uh, something we were doing. And he was like, I want you to sit in on the effects call and you're going to see what it's like to be, I mean, how much they're spending. And so I sat in on the call and you see they're going through every scene telling you how much it costs to do the, the laser, the phasers or the transporter, or we're gonna do this. And it's like, you know, when the effects guys are, are giving you like best case, I mean, like like they're giving you three versions of what the scene could look like. But, but you know, but, but I think it became interesting to see like, oh, there's certain things that you don't necessarily need to see particularly in Star Trek, because if you hear the phaser, you know what that means. If you hear the transporter, like we know what that means, it's, it's, it paints it in our head. So then we were like, oh, to so me, I was like, oh, I don't have to like, you know, like show that. If we just hear it off camera, we know this is happening, you know, or there's, I think that's, that's part of the, the beauty of the show is like you said the, before the canon of it and the legacy of it, there's stuff that the end and what Brandon said about the, the fans are the, the fans are kind of like your collaborators. So it gives you some freedom with what you're trying to do when you're trying to fit stuff with the budget. I mean, I think the biggest thing is like, no, for me, I remember, we, you know, like, like Terry talked to us about what the budget was for the show. I mean, for the episode. So there was a scope of what you could do in terms of trying to write. And I know in the current show, show I am, you know, the, you know, the, it's, it's not as evident what that is. So you don't necessarily know till they come back and they're telling you like after you've written the draft. And so, so that to me was something else. Plus you go down here to the set, you know, and the set we have, the, the main set for season three was this massive set that was so cool. And you get to see, oh, here's how you can use it more effectively, you know, like knowing that were there and that just some other things that were going on with the show that, um, you know, and there was, I mean, there was some really, there was a lot of cool sets. I mean, a lot of, you know, stuff that was getting reused and stuff that we were reshooting and like, I mean, and seeing how they would change certain sets, you know, to, to, to be different starships later on. I mean, like helped a lot to figure out like, you know, I mean, your imagination can run wild, but you know, you got this, this box you got to fit it in and being on set you start seeing like what they can do in a day what the you know like the, how, like how fast the crews move and things like that that just help you with understanding like here's what the scene can do here's what the scene like should do based upon what they are going to have to be able to produce in that time frame that's and for everyone else like what 
what have you learned that has changed or influenced your writing process from your experience in post or on set? I mean, the biggest oh. thing I learned very early on was the the best visual effect you have on a show, the best, the most impactful thing you can do is a close-up of your actor's face. Like, like that is what people are really tuning in to see. They, they What they really want to see is Cisco and Dax talking, you know? They really want to see Quark and, you know, or Bashir or whoever, like they're that's what their focus the real focus is on so so focus on that focus on great character moments focus on moments where you can get a great emotional performance out of your actors because because that's paid for already like that's pattern that's already in the you paid for those people already right. and and no amount of sizzle and no amount of flashbang stuff first of all that stuff's not dependable like that can always go wrong like we have we've had we had a bunch of episodes on deep space nine where like like just even like it was a terrible episode all along, but looking, um, oh God, and now I'm forgetting. Let he's without sin cast the first stone. So that episode was supposed to be a fun lark. We were supposed to be at the beach and we were, we shot it in Malibu and we showed up and it was 60 degrees and cloudy and it was and, and there was a wind and it was freezing and no one could wear swimwear. It was like, so like right away, like all the, a lot of the fun went out and suddenly we had to go into interiors and like, but get on the actor's tell the story, get the emotion. That's that's the, the best thing you can ever do. It's funny. We seem to be at an era where that, you know, actually having more money is sometimes a disadvantage because shows lean into spectacle so easily and can do it so much. A lot of times I watch shows and I go, these guys would have done better with less money. <laughs> yeah. Not Star Trek, but certain other genre shows. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Right. Um, I, uh, Robert, you had mentioned earlier that on DS9, you always wanted to do the, the, the EV suits and you couldn't do them. So for you and for everyone else, what is the, the part of Trek, an episode idea or a character beat that you wish you could have done, but didn't do? I really wish we could have leaned more into Jadzia as queer, you yeah. know, essentially. I mean, we still, I still see a lot of, of, of fans who actually responded really <clears throat> strongly st stronger to the to the to the, the character as being transgender than we ever really even considered her when we were writing her um and or and or that we could have leaned more into the relationship between Bashir and Garrick those were things we were basically <laughs> straight up forbidden from doing you know like we we had the kiss between between uh Dax and and her old spouse that was one of the first same-sex kisses on television and we that was a huge fight and we got a lot of pushback and you know I wish we'd been free to be able to be to honor more those parts of those characters that we just couldn't do back then it really makes me think about how lucky we were with Discovery to be able to present Stamets and Culber um and literally have it not be a thing that you know the fact of their sexuality They're, these are two guys serving together having a life and the conversations and the relationship between them um gets to be so very interesting because we were completely free to do that i mean that's how we treated dax you know which we mm -hmm. was great i mean there, one of the things i see all the time is this meme where i think it's core one of her klingon friends is like you know um hers on my old friend when he first sees jadzia and oh, gives, yeah. gives her a big hug and jadzia says it's jadzia now and he just says like jadzia my old friend <laughs> and just you know big hug and and i i love the relationship the stamets i love that relationship and it was just so nice to see it you know it was sort of a fruition of something that gene had promised way back in the day and not been able to deliver for so long so it was it was lovely to see it sure And uh, for anyone else, what's a what's a regret that you have that you wish you could have done on your tracks or story idea? I, don't know, I used every story idea we had. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Not the, the well, the well yeah. felt pretty dry at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's weirdly like that even on Strange New Worlds. I mean, you'll all, you'll all see it. the craziest ideas we could come up with. We were allowed 
to do like it's it's not a spoiler it's been announced but like we we were like we should do a lower decks crossover where where yes. the lower decks characters are live action and then we'll have an animated part in strange new world and <laughs> everyone was like yeah sure you know that's like great. let's do it that's, all, that's awesome <laughs> i mean i look at your i look at the wall behind you and i see oh yeah we did Die Hard on the Enterprise. Yep. Yeah, it we was did great. the thing. The we thing did. On, on, on. You did the thing all the time. You did the thing. Did you do Total yeah. Recall or Red? Because I mean, that would have been great. I feel like we might have done Total Recall. Yeah, we told we did Total Recall. We did Total Recall. We must have done you did well, Hard Times, of kind of yeah. implanted memory. Oh my God. Which Robert, I think you wrote Hard Time, right? Hard time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think there was something that we put on the board that didn't make it that I, just the concept of it was really amazing. We had this um, Vulcan psychiatric planet, like a psychiatric yeah, board. Chris, I, I, we shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds cool. Yeah. It's like that. I wonder what that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Terry, you want to? I, 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 I will save you, Terry, like, um, I don't, I, I'm not on season two, but I'm looking forward to it for Strange New Worlds. But I do remember in season one, we were kicking around uh, a story that gave Pike a nemesis. And like, Pike is such a boy scout. Like I wanted to see like a person he just absolutely hates and wants to like, just the guy you immediately want to punch in the face. Like I wanted to see that Christopher Pike being uncomfortable. And I think someone pitched kind of like an Adam Scott type. Um, Ooh, that's so, yeah yeah but just see that side of pike that's awesome i, I will say for season uh two uh you know i came in uh uh to to a room with kirsten and michael shaban and akiva and when we had leaned into the idea of time travel of of going back in time the thing i always thought would be the coolest to see is 1990s con era you mm. know like but that is a commitment to an alternate uh, future. Essentially, it's saying Star Trek is not our world. And I, it, it's debatable as to how comfortable Paramount CBS would be in saying that, because I think we all kind of hope Star Trek is our future. Um, but man, I thought that I would have done a really weird 90s con, <laughs> cool World War show that would have been neat. Picard going up against Khan. Yeah, I'd, I'd pay folding money. To see that. that would be really cool. So, uh, oh, unless does anyone else want to chime in on things that they wish they got to tackle? No. All right. Um, I have a question. Uh, some we all get notes, but few of us get notes on something as big as Star Trek. So, how do you? What are some suggestions for, let's say you get a, a bad note, what are some of your suggestions for addressing that without ruffling the egos or feathers of the networks that's giving it? I don't well, know. If anybody's we, figured that out, let me know. <laughs> I'll take that into consideration. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Basically, the, my advice to anybody would be just listen, don't argue, and just say what, what Kirsten just said. Um, We'll look at that and, to, and look at it and give an honest look at, I mean, I look at it. It, you, it may not be addressing the exact note they wanted, but it may make you realize something else wasn't working. You know, what they call right. the note behind the note is really the thing you're, you're mm -hmm. looking for. Yeah. But, but um, I don't know about the, you guys on the new, on the today's Star Trek, but we, did not get studio notes. If we got, we got our notes from Rick Berman. Rick, yeah, Rick. That was Rick. That was it. One person, right? Yeah. yeah. We, the studio would only come in if you were trying to do something controversial, like yeah. the, the subject matter that um, Robert was talking about, yeah. or you're trying to do serialization. <clears throat> uh, so I wish. And I, even then, those notes still came through Rick, right? The studio would right. call Rick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, like, there was a, on, I don't know what season of Voyager it was that I was trying, I wanted to do a season of serialization and um, it was just shut down. But do you guys get notes on like scripts and cuts the, uh, today on Star Trek or do they? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, we have studio, network, producer. Again and again and again. They're there at every step of the process. It just depends which regime is in there. <laughs> it's as to what level you'll get. You no, know, it's it it it, it was always kind of like they were like, it's working, let them do their thing. We don't understand this. I mean, Star Trek was kind of anomalous back in my day. Uh, a lot of more yeah. genre now, but they give they give you notes on what everything. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? To, what do you want? To, everything from casting to yeah. to to look. I mean, I think what are going to get notes on Riker's character? Like, I mean. <laughs> Uh, I'm appalled. Uh, here, <laughs> well, for, it was different for season three than season two, but season two, I mean, it, it again, it depends. The, the shows are considerably more expensive now. Right. That's, the, that's the other thing. And so, whereas, you know, I, I think a season of probably a season of Strange New Worlds, probably you could do two seasons of, or at least do 26 episodes of Next Gen easily. Um, so... <laughs> It, it, it's a it's a it's a you know it's a big investment for them so they want to they want it done right i uh, yeah one of the things of looking back was it was good we only had rick because that's how we got to do 26 a year because we didn't you know we very rarely ever had to rethink that's or right. start from scratch mm -hmm. or do a massive restructure on the fly like the only time we had to do that was when we decided internally that something was badly broken um i mean the, the that was one of the advantages of the machine moving so fast and doing so many episodes a year like we didn't have time <laughs> but, but you know what there, even if you're doing 13 it's it still feels like a lot of it's a lot of episodes still it's a lot of star trek to make and um the, the idea of, of address are they good notes uh, you know we don't need to get into this <laughs> Well, I mean, sometimes they are. They are. Sometimes <laughs> they they are. I mean, they're, because there's a clarity that you thought was obvious that is not. Uh -huh. You know. And so, um, but you it's know, good be, it's good to be humble, right? I mean, it's like sometimes you don't, you know, you don't see everything, and if somebody points something out, you just need to listen to it and appreciate the spirit in which it's given. They're not trying to make a bad show. It's just that sometimes their, you know, their instincts are not particularly well honed, shall we say. I guess like for those on the on this notes tip, like for those who are on the new shows, like what is the familiarity of Trek with the execs who are giving these notes? Or do they do they know the show? Are they they have no knowledge of it whatsoever? Like what's that relationship like? In the next oh, gen days, you know. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. as Jerry says, there have been a few different uh regimes over the yeah. years, and it kind of varies. Um I think they've all been equally passionate about what we're doing. Um, and they're not really afraid to ask questions and dig deep about stuff they don't understand to make sure that, you know, that that the audience is going to be clear on what's happening. Um, I think on the, you know, there's the secret hideout production side and, and you have a very, very um, uh, dedicated group of folks there who um, have learned a ton in the time that I have been there and care very deeply about, um, you know, everything that Star Trek is supposed to be and, and their stewardship of it. Um, so I, I find them to be um, very knowledgeable. And then on the network side, it's, it's, there is knowledge about Star Trek, but, you know, it's helpful that what they're looking at is, is really more clarity of story and character, whether it's Star Trek or not. And all of that stuff has to be there too. But the Star Trek of it, isn't what carries you through. It's what Robert's saying is the characters and the emotions. Um, and sometimes that can get uh, confusing when you're throwing in the sci-fi hooks and all the bells and whistles and effects. Yeah, and 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 if they're good partners, you know, they'll listen. I went, you know, look in season three, I, I, and you can see in the trailer, I brought back Moriarty because it was one of my favorite next gen characters. And there were execs who had no idea who Moriarty was. And I had to get on a call and, and defend why this was a good choice to fly this actor from the East Coast in and, and, and do it and explain that, yes, it is a Sherlock Holmes character, but here's why it's important to the thing. Um, and, you know, they'll, again, it, it's about patience because you can easily react to that in fear, like, oh, my God, they're not going to let me do this really cool thing. 
right. then you you can snark in the meeting and that's bad and it's really just you gotta educate patiently and tell them why emotionally these this is super valuable to these characters it's a great answer and in terms of you know when it comes to pitching ideas for story around the table what are some suggestions you would have for ways writers can successfully get their pitches you know heard like what are some tips that you've used in the room and that's for anyone to answer well, one of the things I'll say is that when I first started on Discovery, um, I it was my first television writer's room, and I was told explicitly that it was my job to police canon and tell people, no, you can't do a thing. But in a writer's room, it really sucks to tell people, no, you can't do a thing. <laughs> um, and the first thing I had to learn was the answer is never no. It's always, um, I see what you're trying to do with that. And if you do it this way, this is how it ripples out over canon. But here's two or three other ways you could maybe get the same thing um, without necessarily breaking canon or affecting it in that way. And that was super important. And now it's always that. I think a story that always that has a baked in character. I mean, a story hook that has a baked in character hook is always a good way to go. Like if you're as far as like trying to pitch episodes. Like if you if you're pitching a, a high concept science fiction idea, if that has a if it has a specific impact on one of your main characters, like the like the fantasy episode with with um, the doctor on on Strange New Worlds, like that was all about his daughter and it was baked in. Like it wasn't just a fantasy for fantasy's sake. It was about the family. It was him about him saving his daughter and connecting with her in a way. And that that's the kind of pitch that really I think always flies or flies more often anyway. Mm -hmm. So grounded more in a in a character driven pitch. Well, where you can see, like, here's the high concept, but <laughs> this is where it's going to affect the character. Like, yeah. like, mm -hmm. and this is the dilemma it will put that character in ultimately. Like, like with with um, Nunian saying and like the Gorn, like that's hugely part of her backstory. So as soon as you pitch, this is the Gorn episode where Nunian Singh is going to deal with Gorn. Okay, like you understand where that character is coming from, you know, and also that it's about the responsibility of the crew towards the people that are going to that die and that people die in space and that it's, you know, how, how, how do professional sort of military officers deal with that and, right. and all that that's all baked in. So now you know, like you, you don't have to look for the character story in the high concept it's there already and that's that's always a winner. Anyone else want to chime in? So in terms of uh, then staffing, then, you know, there's been conflicting discussions about it on the Godforsaken Twitter about, you know, the value of uh, having an original sample to send or a spec of the show that you want to write on. What are your guys' experience with that? And would you suggest that writers you know, how valuable is it for a writer to have a Trek sample for, for consideration on staffing? I don't know. Way, wait, here's a pitch for you. <laughs> Die hard on the Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's fresh but familiar. Yes. <laughs> hey. God. Uh, I heard this that, that's how it works sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I can, I can remember that being pitched, actually. Yeah. That's pretty much how Wasn't it on your board of often pitched ideas that you had the tally marks by? <laughs> oh, God, up, yeah. There was a lot up, on there. Uh, called, I think, Starship Mine. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Yep. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. To, to, you were asking a very good question. Yes. <laughs> Do people I, write specs of episodes anymore? I, I, it's been I, a long it, time since I've read one. It depends. I haven't read one in ages. Yeah, yeah like the... It, I, Again, not shitting on anyone, but I think a lot of the agencies and reps are pushing people towards pilots yeah. in a way that it's like, okay, you have this as a spec and we can possibly take it out as development. It's a twofer. Um, and I would say like to the, the question is like, I don't think you need like a Star Trek spec for a Star Trek show. You just need a spec to show you can mimic someone else's voice while also adding your own perspective or take to that um it's been years since i've 
had to do any of this. Um, so yeah, I, like I haven't seen people giving specs in a while. It's been like pilots and in, in, in one act plays. I would still argue that like whether or not you send it out, writing a spec is a good exercise for writers who are trying to break in and get staff. Because again, you're once you're on staff, you're you're going to have to mimic someone else's voice. You're and you're gonna have to try to make that creator slash showrunner's job easy so that they don't have to like completely rewrite you or maximally rewrite you. And like if you can do that, that's gonna go a long way to that showrunner being like, aha, this is a person that I can, you know, keep around, especially if you're also like good um in the room. So just something to keep in mind. I, I think a show like Strange New Worlds would be like one of those rare shows. It would be great, uh, perfectly amenable to, to have a spec, you know, uh, of that show because it's kind of a self-contained thing. You can showcase a lot of your own interesting ideas. It, it's virtually impossible to write a spec of a serialized show. I mean, it's, 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 it, you, all you can be is wrong, <laughs> you know, and, and that's, yeah. that's all, that's all it can do. It's like something goes, oh, this isn't the show. This isn't, it's not, not doing it. House of the Dragon. Uh, <laughs> there you go. As someone who had to, I wrote a Mad Men spec <laughs> and that got me into the Warner Brothers Writers Workshop. Right. It's a lim you have a limited window if you're going to do that, because it's usually, especially if it's around like the end of that season. Then like, what if this was the season premiere or what if this was this, you know, nebulous episode that could have happened after the season finale? Like, that's the kind of sweet spot that you have to hit. Um, I, I've known a bunch of people who have, have done that. But yeah, like that spec is good for like a year, depending right. on when that show comes back. Yeah. And that was like 15 years ago, <laughs> right? So, I mean, yeah. it's like, it's tough. Uh, what, I, I what think if, it's a tough thing to ask. For it would be kind of interesting, like, to come out with like, well, yeah, I wrote a Cagney and Lacey spec. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. You know what? We can joke about that, that but like, and like, I know the show hasn't been on in a long time, but <laughs> for procedural shows, like when we were on elementary, like I would much rather have read a spec episode of The Mentalist that had been off the air for four years because at least I could go, I could go like, oh, this person can handle a, a, a network. Like when something's in a very specific, like Grey's Anatomy, like a medical show. Like, how do you prove you can write that? Like, I if I were on Grey's Anatomy, I'd happily read an ER, you know, just because right. it would show that they could write that. And and yeah. Star Trek is like that too. But I think there's legal issues where, like, back in the day, we would take specs of Next Generation mm -hmm. and Space Nine all day long, and we'd get sued all year long too. And they had yeah. a giant staff of lawyers to take oh. care of that. You know, I don't well, writers. I don't do writers anymore. got hired off of those specs. I mean, right. in our own writers' rooms. I mean, we had a we had a, a very different. You know, it was a an open submission policy. Everybody, you know, that was a that was a big deal back then. Those things don't exist anymore. <laughs> I mean, that's how Ron got in, right? Ron wrote a spec. Yeah. Renee Chevrolet. That's how Renee. Wrote a spec. That's how Renee got in. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of writers out there who their first Brian Fuller. Got you know got his start because he wrote a Deep Space Nine or Next Generation spec. There's a lot of writers out there that Gabby Stanton, you know, who that's how they got into the business was writing a spec episode of those shows. It's, it's yep. sad that that doesn't happen anymore, honestly. And Terry, when when you were uh, staffing, like how important or did you seek out writers who had like trick scripts or was it just their best sample for you? Was that that's what you looked for? Yeah, it it was uh, it was best sample. It, it didn't even have to be science fiction. It really just had to be character, because um, we certainly had enough nerds in the room. That could <laughs> sci -fi it, 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 um, it it just needed to be great drama. That's great. Uh, we got about fifteen minutes left, so I'm going to kick it to uh, the audience for some questions. Uh, the first question uh, for Narain, uh, from from uh, how does writing, you know, the science fiction of the expanse compare to working on, you know, the science fiction of, of TNG? What did you take from one experience? <laughs> Boy, that's opposite ends of the spectrum. I mean, yeah, I, sure. I, I was, I was a, a science consultant on next generation. Um, and, you know, that kind of, that job was more about kind of maintaining continuity with the fake science of Star Trek, as opposed to real science. And it was a lot of, a lot of jargon right it was kind of like a a spray on kind of a, of a of a science and but that that's what the show was i mean the expanse was much more grounded in in 
you know, the realities of space and physics and, and a million other things. Um, the, the guys who wrote the books built that into, into the story in a very, you know, specific way. A lot of drama and action was generated just simply by the reality of the way things move in those environments. Um, so it was a pretty, it was a pretty extreme difference. <laughs> um, but, you know, but they're, they're their, their own things. I mean, like, you know, the universe has to have internal consistency. Things have to work reliably. And, and you know, a phaser's got to be a phaser. It can't suddenly be something else. And so I think that's just good storytelling. You have to have internal logic in your stories. And that makes your world feel real. That's great. That's a good question. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, for, for, for the whole panel, uh, what was your sample script or spec that got you uh, staffed on a Trek show? Uh, I wrote like a personal story about my, um, it was about my dad, it was about my family. And I, it's something that was, you know, that I, it's something that I didn't write for a long time. And then I decided I wanted to write it. And then I figured out like a way to make it seem, you know, it's, it's something very specific to my, to my life, but I, but I figured out a way to make it feel like just, just open it. People could understand it. People could understand you know, that part of my background. Um, and I got it to Terry and I got it to Alex Kersman and, and, the, and those guys responded well to it. And that was it. Cool. Great script. Thank you. Mine was a, uh, a sci-fi spec pilot that was, uh, it's sort of like space camp meets the thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very uh character driven uh and and weirdly grounded given given what that was but uh yeah <laughs> so that <laughs> I got a meeting with secret hideout based on that and then they happen to see that I have a Star Trek tattoo on my hand and they were like why are you not writing on Star Trek <laughs> you should probably go do that so that's how that worked that's awesome that's cool <laughs> So I didn't actually have a spec. Uh, two other novelists and I um, created a pitch for an entire new truck series. And that's what we pitched to Secret Hideout. And that's how I was hired. That's cool. Brennan, I know it's been a long time, but do you remember yours? Mine? Oh, I know you started as, the, as an intern there, but. Yeah, no, I know I came into an internship program with the Academy of TV Arts and Sciences. Right. And, um, and so I didn't really have a spec script. Um, there was, I don't remember, I did have a script sample um, and I can't quite remember what it was. It might've been an original piece. Uh, I also had written a spec based on a show, a John Ritter show that didn't last very long called Hooperman. Good show. Uh, Hooperman. No one's ever heard of. That it, I saw Hooperman. It's embarrassing even to admit. Uh, but, uh, I don't know it, it was more of a, it was a different way in the internship thing. Oh. And that is a way in, by the way, the Writers <laughs> Guild has an internship, a very good internship program. And, um, you know, it's there, that, that's a way to get onto a staff being an, a writer's assistant, yeah. or an assistant to a producer is, is not a bad idea. That's what Terry did, you know? Yeah. I was a Writers Guild intern. Uh, I, I came in through an internship program. I think the first thing I wrote was this was a spec Star Trek, of course, Next Generation. But um, but yeah, I came in as a as a WGA intern. We had interns on TNG like every six weeks or eight weeks, we would rotate them out. Yeah, um, and a lot of those people went on to staff, and um, it was a great program, and and it was a great experience just being in a room, listening, learning how to break a story. Um, you know, Michael Pillar would would come in there and then, you know, tell us where we screwed up and how to make things better. And it was it was really a great, um, a really great education, even, you know, just for those six weeks of the internship. I came in through the I came into the open pitch policy oh, back wow. in the day and uh, I did not I, I had a science fiction feature that almost got made like three times. It was like a futuristic Spartacus. and. <clears throat> somehow 
that got, I don't know whether you guys read that. I think what happened was my agent just called up and said, I've got a writer who can pitch science fiction. And I got invited into pitch, to be honest. And then I sold a pitch. And I think someone read that feature to see if I could actually write the script for um, Fistful of Datas. So they, they, um, they let me do that. And then Brandon fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Kayla, did you just drop malignant on their desk and say, <laughs> no, I had actually been developing another IP with Akiva Goldman. And oh, when that fell through, he was like, Hey, I wrote this pilot for a new Star Trek spinoff. Are you interested? And I'm like, hell yeah, I am. Um, and so that's what got me in the door. I don't, I don't know what material my reps sent over to Henry though. I think that's everyone. Um, question for Michaela: How did you guys work in Cybok into Strange New Worlds? And was that ever off limits? Was any characters off limits? I think that was after me. Like, was that? Did we discuss? I remember. The, I that's think I can say I remember the cat discussion. That Star Trek Five guy. The guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Spock half brother. Yeah. Yeah. Because there was like an episode that changed. There was an episode that changed a lot. Uh, is the the Spock cat episode? Do you remember? Like, yeah. So I think it might have came up then, and then it was like, oh, that's interesting. And it's just like, even though that episode didn't happen, and in that aspect changed, like Cybok was in the air at that point. So it's like we gotta, we should drop him in at some point. I feel and then, like, and then it was the the sexy space pirate. Yeah, I feel like we have the space pirate part of the story down. Mm -hmm. And once we made the connection to between Spock and Angel, um, somebody threw out, I feel like it might even have been Kiva, yeah. threw out Cyborg. And it was like, yes. We were I want to say, I might have been out of the room on script. <laughs> you might have been. <laughs> yeah. Pro tip on that is, is if you're going to introduce a character at the end of an episode, don't show their face because you're never going to get the actor you want then. <laughs> no. Wait till you've got a whole episode and then you can get the actor. And uh, when, this is for everyone, when you started writing about Trek, was there a holy grail character or alien species that you really wanted to write for? There was. Um, and I don't, I pitch it just to pitch it, and I wouldn't even know how we would have done this, but one of the creatures in Star Trek The Next Generation, when it was introduced, that was always fascinating to me, was the crystalline entity, yeah. um, and I always wanted to know more about that thing, like, not necessarily even an origin story, but I'm like, is there a way we can drop this thing in there at all? No? Okay, I'll shut up now, but... <laughs> Like that was, that was, yeah. We, we tried, we talked about a lot about that at the time too. I mean, oh, I, wow. and um, also could not quite figure out <laughs> what to do with it. With the... <laughs> it was just, it was so fascinating. Cause I think that was like, at least for me as a young Star Trek fan, like huge. Uh, it Like you watched a, a good person essentially commit genocide in Star Trek and that was just like so shocking yeah. especially like right when they're on the cusp was like no we can communicate with it maybe we can nope she blew it up she <laughs> grief took over everything and like that was always just like a fascinating storyline to me that was like heartbreaking and, and tragic but I kind of got it you know so yeah I, I always wanted to know more about the crystalline entity because basically it's it's a creature that's just doing what it's gonna do <laughs> it doesn't know any better it's just doing its thing. Yeah. It's like the doomsday machine. I always had a lot of affection for the, um, when you revisit the old, uh, the original series characters on, on Next Generation. In particular, Relics, I thought was really lovely. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think, yeah, I mean, it's just, just, you know, it's what you connect to like when you're a kid, right? It's like, you, you and then you go, oh God, I'm in this thing that's completely new and, and we could actually meet Scotty again. That would be amazing. How are we going to do that? Um, you know, and it's just kind of, I mean, and now we're kind of 
coming to the next generations of that, right? I mean, it's like th these characters are coming back um, into all of these different incarnations. And it's just kind of fun to see. I mean, it's part of the joy of it. And it's, it's an interesting continuity across a lot of generations. And I think that's why families attach to it. Yeah. You know, I mean, like parents and their kids yeah. can share it. Yeah. I always wanted to write Spock or Vulcans in general, and we never did it on Deep Space Nine until I got to write one on season seven when I came back as a freelancer, uh, and I made it. him a serial killer. So that was... Love it. <laughs> I put a joke about that in, deep, in uh, Lower Decks, and when they played Star Trek Clue, and the killer was a Vulcan with a sniper rifle that can shoot through walls. Nice! <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sounds like that uh, Vulcan might have ended up on the Vulcan psych psychiatry. <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, there was so much cool stuff that we did on season three. I can't talk about it, but it was just <laughs> yes, because you're walking right, right there. Well, no, it, <laughs> okay, it's funny because so, there's one character I totally <laughs> want to say right now that I absolutely cannot say that the gentlemen here have all written for. Like, so it's yeah. I mean, it's a unique. Yeah, it was. It was great. It was. All, I mean, it was so much fun. Just yeah. I just you know. It, but I don't want to. We're not going to give it away. But it was. There was a lot of stuff that we, you know, hoped to do, and then we did do, and it was. It was just fun to, to have that chance to do that. I mean, that to me was one of the best things of, of, about doing that third season was <laughs> the ideas that we were able to like. Oh, is that something we can do? And then we and, and then we put something to Terry, and he'd go. I gotta go see what this, what they're gonna say. And then you come back with like, yes, we can do it. And it was just all, you know, like super cool to do. I remember when we saw the, um, the, the cut for 301 and we were just all amazed. We were just amazed. It was just one of these amazing days as, as you know, as as being on this show, being on this franchise. I just, I mean, that was a really, um, that was a special day for me to see the, yeah, to see that, so. I always wanted to write for James T. Kirk, but Brandon killed him. <laughs> <laughs> in the Nexus. He's in the Nexus. Go get him. He's cooking some eggs. Get some eggs, yeah. <laughs> Chopping they, some eggs. By the way, if you if you wanted a glimpse of what it was like to for Brandon and I, I, I would bring that up at least once a week. <laughs> of course, of six eggs, years, he seven Kirk. years I was your assistant. It was Vaughn killed Kirk. <laughs> 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 I, I, bet, I bet when you're not here when ron's not when ron's alone you're you're the one who did it yeah so exactly, exactly. <laughs> um two uh last questions uh we kind of touched mm -hmm. on this a little bit in the panel but this is a this is a good one um with the prolifer with the proliferation of serialized stories and star trek incorporating more of them what is gained or lost by the ability of embracing more serialized story versus the episodic mission of the week stuff because we don't get cause and effects anymore. Oh, well, strange, strange new worlds, world. you do. Yeah. Strange yeah. new worlds, yeah. 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 yeah, strange new worlds. Yeah. I mean, that's what they're doing. I mean, I, I, if anything, I think about uh, the um, ability for characters to grow and change over time. Um, and, and there's value in that for me in the land of Star Trek. Um, you know, I, it's not that there's anything wrong with um the Kirk Spock McCoy model where we sort of these guys who are who they are at the beginning and they are who they are at the end and they've certainly developed a relationship along the way but really consciously charting that out and um and setting all of that up means I think we get to go deeper and further with character in a way that's very satisfying as a storyteller I also just to piggyback on that I think it like humanizes those characters in that like it's not just like the one off and then they're fine like we all know the famous Star Trek the next generation episode the inner light I think that's the title like right. Picard goes through something incredibly <laughs> profound and then the next week no one mentions it he's not changed I don't I don't know if it ever came up again within the series I had him play that flute yeah but yeah, yeah but it's, yeah but then you get like, that's what I, and I am a huge fan of Star Trek First Contact. And then you see that like his encounter with the Borg did affect him. He's full of vengeance, which is not a dynamic or a shade of 
Picard that we've ever seen before. He's traumatized, possibly PTSD, and it's driving his decisions. And we're just like, no, don't do that. Listen to Alfred Woodard. So like in, in calling that back, it, like it humanized him in a way that like made me just love Captain Picard even more. We, yeah. we have to fight for those serialization elements in Next Generation. Like even I, I remember when Ron did Family, that was Picard going back after the Borg. That was like a, a just a, I think Rick hated that episode, didn't he? He just, yeah. he was, he just, I mean, it was just a, it was, it was problematic because that was acknowledging something that was acknowledging mm -hmm. trauma. It was, it was, you know, every little thing that, you know, that happened to the characters in I think in the later years of Next Generation there's we were trying for you know developing Deanna Troy as a character putting her in a uniform like trying to show some growth but all of those were were struggles and I think it was just you know the series and television being what it was in that time we were sort of trying to push it out of its mold a little bit and, and I think you know you get little dribs and drabs of it Imagine um, that, that was what was one of the things that was so radical about 24. Right. They were killing characters. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's something that is, was absolutely, totally 100% out of the question. On a network show, on a big network show, yeah. Completely new. And I just want to say that hearing about all these limitations you guys talk about um, back in the day, for me, makes what you did achieve even more extraordinary. Right. Maybe yeah. you haven't seen all the episodes. Clearly <laughs> <laughs> really, oh, really not. Yes. Have you seen Fascination? Because there are not. some. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's like one star. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that. We always knew there was going to be like two stinkers. One to two stinkers. Uh, <laughs> you put you, weirdly, uh, weirdly, you yeah. weirdly you planned for it. You go, you would go like, okay, we're going to have a couple of D's. We're going to have a few C's. Okay. okay. Can I, can I ask you guys a question? <laughs> yes, too. Yeah. Like the, and this has kind of become like a cult favorite episode, but like when, uh, Dr. Crusher goes back to her oh, grandma's gross. house yeah. gross, that. Candle. <laughs> and lights that candle. Like, no, was it discussed in the room that like, she's banging a ghost or like, how did you guys? <laughs> oh, I wrote that up. <laughs> Hey, hey man. You'll you... find you'll find that I wrote all the bad episodes. Uh, oh. Oh. Look, it kind of has become like an enjoyable. Co you I don't never know, like, set out. Was... You never set out to make a bad episode. The concept <laughs> behind that hair that uh, hairbrained episode was. You also have to look at where it is in the season. It's probably later. Very the, late. Episode sixteen, seventeen. Yeah, that feels like where March, we start. March or April. It's like, it's like a March of death at that point. Like we are desperate. But the concept behind that episode was to, I was a big fan of uh, Henry James' Turn of the Screw, and uh, I wanted to do a gothic uh, ghost romance. And um, that, you know, I thought, and give Crusher a good, you know, meaty story. And the, it just went off the rails, man. The whole concept that there would be a colony that bases it, that based itself on I Ireland. <laughs> it's so freaking stupid. I mean, it's just like it's like cosplay planet or something. Um, and then yeah. some bad. There's a line of dialogue in there that Renea Shavria used to quote in at me all the time about I can travel through the trend, the ghost saying, I can travel through the energy beam or something like that it's but you but i didn't set out to make a bad episode. it just <laughs> turned out really bad a lot of people love that I episode like though i just it, remember you know it's it. a meme it's a meme now of the candle and her now it's a it's a big deal oh my god i just think it was like at the time it's like okay so we're finally giving crusher a love interest and she's she's getting hers and it's a ghost. It's <laughs> alien. He just seemed like a ghost. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. you, know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, make me uncomfortable, man. <laughs> Before we wrap up, is there anything the panelists would like to ask each other? I'm just curious if there's if there's anything you guys would like to talk to some of these uh, legacy people. Well, I just want to throw some love at uh, yeah. the animated show. Oh yeah, Lower Decks is so much fun. Lower Decks, yeah. is, Lower Decks is great. 
so uh, much fun. It hasn't was only mentioned once, but uh, <clears throat> I really want to compliment everyone who's involved with that show. It's it is a real Valentine to Star Trek, while at the same time being its own thing. Yeah, yeah. it is a real. It, all everyone who works on it uh, is doing it all with love, and it's a it's a really it. great group of people. You can feel it. You can really feel yeah. it. It's it's lovely. Uh, that that Deep Space Nine episode was was very amazing. Touching. Yeah. And the most fun, I mean, just a writer's room where you just sit around and remember this epic, remember Sub Roslaw? That, that <laughs> it's a lot of that, just nonstop. And it's very fun. <laughs> Oh, I'll just say to like the the next generation guys, because like Brandon brought it up, but like I think it's best of both worlds. Like that to be continued. <laughs> I remember seeing that when it aired, and it just blew my mind that you ended on Riker going Mr. Wharf fire, and then it cut to black. And I was like, ah shit. Like <laughs> it's May. I gotta wait till like September to see this, like. I got to wish away my summer because now I want to know what happened. Like, I <laughs> really, really, really want. Back then, you only, you had to wait 12, three yeah. whole months. Where yes. today, you sometimes wait three years for a show to come back. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I was a little kid who loved summer. I was just like, when this comes back on, I'll be back in school. Fuck. <laughs> but I wanted to see it. Like, it, it blew my mind. And it's one of the reasons I'm here now because like I could not believe you could do that with television like I was one of those viewers it's just like whoa they might actually kill Captain Picard what is going on that's a great clip cool. does anyone else have anything they want to sign off with before we go well I just want to tell Brandon and, and this is kind of a, an exclusive thing here that season three is in fact a sequel to Sub Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda Plummer plays the candle, and it's a thing. And this is going to be in all the Star Trek sites tomorrow morning. I know it, but I just want you to know it's for you, man. Thanks, man. I'm pitching hard to just do an Enterprise sequel. Kirsten knows my Enterprise love. I'm always like, let's just pick up where Enterprise left off, guys. We'll figure it out. Enterprise is underrated. It's a it's a damn fun sci-fi. <laughs> love it. This is a delight to do a panel like this. I mean, how many shows can actually reach across this many variations and versions and generations? It's uh, decades. This, yeah, this it's, is great. Yeah, decades. Like, I mean, thanks for doing this. This has been do blast. it again. Yeah, <laughs> you guys for doing great well. meeting you guys. Yeah, I I, Very I, nice I, meet you guys. I got to talk to Brandon about Cause and Effect earlier this year, and I <laughs> already told him this, but Cause and Effect and Robert's episode of The Wire, they're the reason why I'm sitting here talking with you. Those help me sell my my first thing that got me into the guild so the things you guys have made have gotten me closer to the stuff I want to make so I really appreciate you making the time to talk about this uh, it's a it, the little kid who turned his parents basement into the enterprise a when he was 10 <laughs> and pissed off his dad's <laughs> name when he uh, blew it up like actually I, I burned it down um <laughs> uh, this is a big deal so uh, I really appreciate your time and thank you everyone for uh, carving out some time uh, 12 days before Christmas to hang out with us and nerd out about Trek. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Have a good holiday, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.